Tonight we have uh, Jeremy Hamburger um, sitting right up here. He's a UW-Madison graduate student in entomology. That's the study of insects. He's interested in pollinator ecology, insect foraging, and especially bumblebee biology and conservation. Jeremy looks at the world as a bee, especially as a bumblebee does, and tries to determine how good a landscape is it from the bee's point of view. Are there enough flowers? Are they the right kind? Farmers recognize the importance of bees, and Jeremy hopes to be able to inform the farmers and others who care about bees and bee conservation how to assess the suitability of a landscape for bees. He is part of his departmental outreach group, the Insect Ambassadors, which I think sounds like a great name for a band. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy isn't um, too far into his graduate career, but already he is discovering the joys of fieldwork. Everyone has heard what happens when you close the doors after the cows have left. But what would happen if you close the barn doors before they all arrived? Well, it wasn't cows, but bees. What did Jeremy find when he closed the entrance to a bee colony before all the bees returned? So this is your multiple choice. A, the returning bees flew away and started a new colony. Or B, B, <laughs> the returning bees knocked on the door and politely asked to be let back in. Or C, they yelled, let's get them, and attacked the beekeeper. And Jeremy, that is in fact what happened, and poor Jeremy in the future will remember to bring his bee suit whenever he decides to piss off the bees. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Jeremy Hamburger. All right. Good, my mic works. Thank you guys so much for having me. This is fantastic to see so many people out here that are excited to hear about insects. Like, this is like the dream for me, like walking out and seeing a huge group of people like this. So that makes me really happy. I do a lot of outreach with kids, and they're always really excited, and it's fun to see them. But seeing a bunch of adults, especially in northern Wisconsin, that are psyched on hearing about bees, like, the hair stands up on the back of my neck. So thank you guys so much for having me. And I noticed that no one like ran out of the room either when they said you could go to the library, because let's be honest, like there's actual beer here. So like, <laughs> don't go anywhere, grab a pint, sit down, we'll, be, we'll have fun. So I want to talk briefly before we start getting into questions about why I care about bees so much. I mean, obviously, Susan did a great job of going through some of the great things that bees do for us, and I'm sure all of you know that, but I'm going to walk through it anyways just because it's fun to talk about. These are fascinating organisms. So pollinators are really important for two main reasons, for both economic reasons and for ecological reasons. So first off, we'll talk about the economic reasons because we're people and oftentimes we care about money. And pollinators are beneficial to 70% of the economically important crops worldwide. Now, if you add that up across the entire world, that's about $200 billion in income for growers, farmers, people that are growing things like apples, cranberries, almonds, all these types of foods that we care about, coffee, chocolate, all of those things depend on insects to produce. Now, they're also important ecologically. And when I say that, let's think of the group, the angiosperms, so the flowering plants. 90% of those species depend on some sort of an animal to move pollen from the, female part of the, or the male part of the plant to the female part of the plant. That's important for maintaining the diversity of plants and stuff like that, but it's also important to maintaining the feedstock, so things like seeds, fruits, and nuts for animals to eat as well, which is obviously something that we care about as hunters, fishermen, etc. Now, why bees? If we have all these organisms that potentially can be pollinators, why are, why are bees so important? And the truth is that they are the number one most important pollinator because they are so damn good at it. They are built purpose-built for this job. They have a variety of adaptations on their body that allow them to collect pollen really well. They have these long branched hairs that gather pollen that have a static charge that pollen can basically just stick to right away. And they also have to visit flowers. These things are actually eating the pollen and nectar. So back home in these bee colonies, if you think about a honeybee colony, those honeybees are going out and getting that pollen and nectar and bringing it back and feeding it to their offspring. So they need that in order to actually maintain successful generations into the future. And if you guys may think about the honeybee, we can also manage these things. So we can take them, we can put them in a box, we can put them out in an apple orchard and actually get a product from their services. And then when we're done with them there, we can take them, put them on a semi-truck, send them over to California or wherever they need to go to pollinate almonds or to pollinate sunflowers in South Dakota, anything like that. 
And they're also abundant. There's a huge diversity of bees on this planet. I'll start from small and work our way up. In Wisconsin, we have 500 different species of wild bees. That's not including honeybees. Honeybees are actually not native. They are from Europe. They're the European honeybee. They're what we call a naturalized species. So they're here now and kind of here to stay because we have such a good you know, niche market for them to do all this work. In North America, we're looking at 4,000 species of wild bees. With a mo most of that diversity is going to be in the southwest area of Arizona, actually. They really like some of those cool desert ephemeral flowers. And if we blow up all the way worldwide, it's 20,000 species of bees, just bees. That's not including things like the wasps and whatnot. Those are a different family. Just the bees, 20,000 species, which is crazy. And when we tend to think about them, we think about one individual, right? We think about the honeybee. Now, there are a lot of other animals that do pollination for us. So we think about things like bats, hummingbirds, butterflies, moss, beetles, and even flies. Those are all things they're going to be pollinating as well. But the truth is, none of them can touch bees when it comes to the quantity of pollination services that they provide. Bees really just take the cake there. So I talked about the honeybee and how important that is for us. And it really is. It's fantastic. We can have such control over it. We can ship it all over the country. But if we have that great tool, why do we need all these wild bees? Why should we care about these wild bees? That's a question I get asked all the time. Well, well, honeybees are doing a great job for us. Why should we have to focus on all of our efforts on these other bees? And we tend to think of this like an insurance policy. So I'll use an analogy here that I actually just thought of like five minutes ago, so bear with me if it kind of sucks. <laughs> so imagine that you have your favorite wrench. This is a wrench that you use to fix your leaky sink every time it leaks. And there are a bunch of other wrenches out there that you could use, but you use this one because it works really, really well. And you use that wrench so much and for so long that eventually all these other wrench makers kind of disappear and you don't, they, don't, they go away, you don't need them anymore. But then one day that favorite trusty wrench of yours breaks and it doesn't get made anymore, there's no replacement parts for it, and no one knows how to fix it. What are you going to do to fix your leaky sink then? So that, that wrench in that example is the honeybee. So if we have this amazing, awesome tool, what happens if that tool disappears on us, and in the meantime, all the other things that could be doing this work, these wild bees, have kind of faded away in the background and disappeared? What do we do then? Well, a lot of places in the world actually have to use people to do pollination. So places like China, they actually have people going around with paintbrushes and apple trees and put, moving pollen from one variety to the other, one by one by one. And I don't think that's probably anyone's uh, future career path here. I don't think anyone's really like jumping at the bit to be doing that. And the truth is, we can't do it as good as bees can. Now, honeybee costs and stuff like that are also one thing. So when honeybees go down, it increases the cost to growers to rent these things. So colony collapse disorder and just general declines in the amount of honeybees that we have are raising the cost. So growers can't get access to these things as easy as they could before. And in turn, is going to affect things like the price of fruit. And wild bees are available to pick up this slack. They can, they can do this work for us, and they oftentimes can do it even better than honeybees can. Now, wild bees are awesome, especially I'm going to use the bumblebee as a prime example here because they're the best. They're the coolest things ever. I've totally fallen in love with them over the past two years, and here's why. So for one, they're a lot more efficient at pollinating than honeybees are for a number of reasons. One, they're bigger. They can carry more pollen. They can fly farther. Two, they have this really cool capacity to do what's called buzz pollination. So when you guys think of bumblebees, you oftentimes will think of that charismatic sound they make when they're on a flower. And what that actually is, is if you look at them when they're doing that, you'll notice they're making this buzzing sound, but that you'd think that would be the wings moving, and in fact, that's not. What they do is they land on the stamen of the flower, and they disconnect the muscles that they would use to move their wings and just vibrate them. That process is called sonication, and what happens is Basically, all that pollen just falls off of the anther of the flower onto the bee. It basically just shakes it loose, and that pollen's normally held on really, really tightly. And they're also a lot more active than honeybees are. So honeybees, um, I'm going to use a, an example that a, a cranberry grower told me about this year that I think is fantastic, and it has a little bit of a, a pseudo-political spin on it, so bear with me. So he, the, the cranberry growers typically use honeybees for pollination. They bring them in in large quantities. But unfortunately, honeybees are kind of picky. And the grower that I talked to, he, he likened honeybees to what he called union bees because they have very specific conditions under which they'll work. They don't like it cold, they don't like it too hot, they don't like it when it's not sunny, and they don't like rain. Versus the bumblebees and the wild bees, which pretty much are out 
regardless of the weather, because they've got to get that stuff done. They've got to get food for their offspring. And that process that bumblebees have, that buzz pollination, can also be used to actually regulate the temperature within their body. So us as humans, we're warm-blooded, right? We maintain a constant temperature inside. Insects are all cold-blooded. Bumblebees are fascinating because they are what we call uh, facultative endotherms. That huge word basically means that bumblebees have the capacity to somewhat regulate their body temperature, and they do that simply by vibrating the muscles in their body. So they'll sit inside their colony, they'll all bunch up, they'll all vibrate together till they reach the temperature that they have to get to to fly, they'll go out and they'll do their work getting pollen and nectar, then they'll come back. Honeybees can't do that. So that's a lot, one thing that makes them really f quite fantastic. Probably the best reason, though, uh, they're free. We don't have to pay for their services. They're there already, they can provide these things for us, and we don't have to worry about bringing them over from California or from South Dakota or wherever they might be. So with all these, all these cool things we know about wild bees now, how can we go about actually protecting them? How should we go about conserving them? How should we go about bolstering their communities so that we have better populations of them? Well, the first thing that we need to figure out is, well, what are they like? What do they like to be in? What environments do they like to be in? What habitats do they like to be in? What flowers do they like? And it seems like a simple question, but it's something that as entomologists we don't know a whole lot about, actually. And do they need areas rich in flowers? Do they need areas rich in nesting resources? Does it need to be structured in some way? Does it need to be a certain distance from this thing or the other? Does it need to be free from human intervention? Could there be no pesticides there? Can there be some pesticides there? How do we know that? And a lot of the previous research that people have done have kind of used what we call expert opinion. So they actually go out and they'll ask bee biologists, people like me, people like Claudio, my advisor, what do you think about bumblebees and these different environments? How do they like cornfields? How do they like soybean fields? How do they like prairies? And we actually basically fill out these surveys that allows us to rank their preference for how these uh, landscapes are for flowers, how these landscapes are for nesting resources. And that kind of allows us to build this kind of map of basically taking all the different land uses that we have in an area, ranking each one of them based on these different resource availabilities to bees, and then we can actually produce this map that says, here's where we expect bees to be. And that works really well at a broad scale. We can get a good idea of, okay, this area, it looks like we know a lot about bees. But for the most part, when you do this kind of a model on a broad, like nationwide scale, what you end up getting is actually a lot of like unknown. It's a lot of, we don't know about this area. And that's kind of not a good thing if you want to, for example, develop I've been told to pause. Oh, no, never good. Never mind. Careful not to touch it too much. Uh, so that can help us develop things like conservation strategies on a farm scale, on a small scale that we can actually go onto people's properties and say, these are the areas on your property where you should really be focusing on not turning this into corn or soy, but maybe actually instead planting more flowers here and doing things like that. Now, this would be really fantastic if I could just walk up to a bumblebee and be like, hi, Ms. Mrs. Bumblebee, how do you like your habitat? Do you like it? Please fill out this survey. Unfortunately, I can't do that. I wish I could. It would make my life a lot easier. Um, but I can't ask bees what they prefer to do. So instead, what I have to do is rely on some form of their behavior. I have to observe something that they do that allows them to tell that story to me in, a, in some translatable way. So I have to develop some sort of Rosetta Stone to translate bee behavior into them telling me this place sucks or this place is awesome. And when we think about a bumblebee, the typical thing that we, th we see them doing is exactly the behavior that I care about, and that's gathering pollen and nectar. We see them out on flowers. We see them eating, gathering pollen on their legs. We see them slurping down nectar for themselves. And that's exactly what I could use to tell them, tell, have them tell me something about what their environment is. So bumblebees are a social bee species, which means they have a central colony. So those, all the bees you typically see out, at least during the middle part of the summer, are workers. Those are females. They're basically clones of the, of the queen, the queen bumblebee who's back in the nest. And they'll go out and they'll make these foraging trips for pollen and nectar, and they'll bring all those resources back for their brood, for the offspring that they're producing. And I'm thinking that basically the amount of time that they spend out in that environment might be indicative of what's out there. So if a bee is out there for a really, really, really long time, maybe it's because they can't find what they need. They have to search all over high and low for the flowers they need to get the pollen and nectar. 
But if they're out for a very short amount of time, maybe it's they went out, boom, they found exactly what they needed, they can gather it, and they can bring it back. So, um, where am I here? So, it's to be really easy to do if I could just like go out and count all of the flowers in the landscape and basically produce a map of all these flowers. But again, really difficult to do. There's a lot of flowers and there's a lot of private land in Wisconsin that I don't want to have to go and knock on 3,000 doors to figure out where all the flowers are. So I have to figure out a way to do this kind of from the other side, from the bees' perspective. So what I do is actually develop some sort of a system, and I didn't develop it, I'm using it, is called um, RFID, which is Radio Frequency Identification. So if I can figure out a way to actually time all these bees as they're out foraging, maybe I can use that behavior to tell me about their environment. So this technology is pretty cool. If you think of everyone who's driven in Illinois before and the tolls, I hope pretty much everybody, that is the same technology, the iPass system, is the same technology that I'm using. I'm basically just scaling it down to the, a bee iPass. So I have these managed colonies that I purchase. They're actually purchased for like apple growers or cranberry growers, and they have a queen inside and a bunch of workers. And I take these and I basically stick them in different environments, and I attach this radio frequency identification system to it, and I then super glue these little tiny transmitters that are either the size of a grain of rice or they're one millimeter by one millimeter. And I was going to bring some tonight, and I totally forgot. You wouldn't be able to see them anyways if I held them up, but I super glue those to the backs of the bees. And then as they're coming out of their colony, they go through a detector, which basically tells me I'm leaving and I'm coming back. So that I can just take the difference between I'm leaving and I'm coming back and know exactly how long that bee was out foraging for pollen and nectar. So, which is pretty cool. Um, and that gives, me, that gives me exactly what I need. It gives me all that detailed foraging information for bees across a variety of different landscapes. So I can put them in any system. I can put them in the middle of a cornfield and see how they perform. I can put them in a prairie and see how they perform. I can put them, like I have a colony right now, on the top of Russell Labs in downtown Madison. I go up to the roof twice a week and look at them. They have, they're up there with our honeybee colonies, and they actually seem to be doing all right, which is surprising, considering they're a ground-nesting species and they're on a 120-foot tall building, and somehow they've figured out that they're up there, which is pretty cool. So the first step in all of this is, this is a great idea, and I'm borrowing a lot of elements from foraging theory from mammals and birds, which is kind of a far stretch from arthropods. They behave quite a bit differently. Um, and the first step to all this was basically figuring out, okay, do bees actually respond behaviorally to changes in a landscape? Do they respond to differing levels of flowers, for example? And th there's some literature that suggests, yes, they do, and there's some literature that suggests, mm, maybe not. So I had to test this idea out. And luckily, we have a couple really cool uh, agricultural systems that allow me to test this really easily. That was cranberry. So cranberries are a really cool crop. They're fantastic for our state because they're our pretty much number one export. Uh, we produce the most cranberries of any state in the United States. Um, and cranberries all come into bloom in mass in uh, mid-June to early July. So we have this huge, huge pulse of all these flowers that these bees want to go to in that mid part of June, which is a huge, you know, if compared to the background levels of flowers in central Wisconsin, it's, it's insane. There are billions of flowers available to these bees. And what I did is actually put bumblebee colonies out in these cranberry marshes and tried to see, okay, when the bees start foraging in the beginning of June, do they change their foraging behavior when these cranberries come into bloom? And in fact, at least the preliminary data, I won't speak too much of this yet because I literally just started looking at it this week, but the preliminary data suggests that in certain landscapes, yes, the bees do respond to this pulse of resources. They change their behavior and actually move from the flowers outside of the marsh into the into the actual marsh itself. So that, that proof of concept basically gives me all the ammunition that I need to be like, okay, this, this method works. I can use foraging behavior to tell me about this landscape that the bees are living in. So all of these data that I'm trying to gather are kind of a, an effort. It's a, it's a very first step in an effort to basically conserve wild bees. And what we're going to do with these data are basically try to translate them into some sort of predictive model that actually tells me, based on the land cover of, you know, of, for example, Wisconsin or a farm, how good is that habitat for bees? Where are the hot spots where we expect to find bees? 
Where are the cold spots where we're not expecting to find them? And how can we make more hot spots where we can find more bees? How can we help growers to develop more conservation strategies, to put in more flowers, and all that stuff? So it's, it's a pretty cool project, and um, it's a lot of fun. And like Susan mentioned before, it is a little bit dangerous sometimes when you piss off bees. They tend to sting you. Um, I, I've gotten stung, I think, 15 times so far, which isn't terrible. Seven of those were on that incidents that Susan described. Um, and I got chased out of a marsh. I had to leave all of my equipment, including my laptop, behind, make a mad dash to Madison to get my bee suit, come back, and then go retrieve it all. So that was fun. Um, so that's kind of that, that's the basics. That's, that's the whole pollinator spiel in you know, 20 minutes. So hopefully that made sense to people. And I'd, I'd love to hear questions. I'm sure people have questions to ask, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys think. So stand by for the mic. So just raise your hand. Carol is wandering around with the microphone. And remember how to hold it. I wanted to ask you about uh, the beautiful tricolored bumblebee, um, Bombus ternarius or whatever it is. Yep. I went online. I can't remember the website. But it said that they preferred blue flowers. Yep. And um, my very impressionistic impressionistic experience is that, that that is true in our flower garden. Do you have an opinion about that? Yeah, definitely. So bumblebees are a little bit different than other organisms that they see in a particular area of the electromagnetic spectrum. So bumblebees actually can't see red. So it's rare to see bumblebees on red flowers. You might see them sometimes on pinks, which are, have some white hues in them. So their, their vision is basically shifted up into the UV side. And those violets and blue colors are in the high end of the visible spectrum closer to UV. So that's why they're more attracted to those, uh, what, what's thought to be why they're more attracted to those. So the things that are attracted to the red flowers tend to be more of the mammals, the bats and hummingbirds, for example, which can actually see that red color. And then some flowers actually fluoresce in ultraviolet. So you can actually, if you look at a, an image of a flower in UV versus visible light, they have these really awesome patterns on the petals that basically act as a runway to say, hey, bee, come down here. Where that's, this is where the good stuff is, which is basically telling them, hey, come pollinate me because I need to reproduce. So re regarding their foraging behavior and measuring their foraging behavior, I don't know if I missed something, but you're measuring the difference in time between when the bee leaves its nest and then how long it's gone and then when it comes back. So you measure the difference between leaving and coming back. What are you determining that they're doing, if, depending on length of time? The longer they're out, the what? Or the shorter time yep. they're out, the what? Exactly. So I'm assuming my, my, my working assumption and based on some other research that's been done is that if they're out for longer periods of time, they have to search for more time to find what they need or, or, go, far, or go farther away to find what they need versus if they're out for a short amount of time, they're finding it quickly, getting what they need, and then coming back. And I can also look at not just the time that they're out, the average time, but I can also look at the variation in that time. So if you look at a colony of bumblebees and they're all over the place in their time, sometimes they're out for 20 minutes, sometimes they're out for three hours, 20 minutes, three hours, that tells me that they're maybe doing a lot of back and forth versus bees that are 28 minutes, 28 minutes, 28 minutes, 28 minutes. They've found a good spot, and they're just going back and hitting it repeatedly. Uh, during the cranberry bloom, where they're changing their patterns, yep. is the foraging pattern just changing where they're going out for longer trips, or are they actually moving the entire colony over to where they know there's good resources? So that's just the foraging times that are changing. Their, their colonies are stationary. So the queen is basically stuck inside this box. For, for, in my case, it's a box. If it was a natural colony, they'd have a nest set up. So they stay there the whole time. So just their foraging times are changing. It's super glue. So the, that's a great question. So because... Because, yep, yep, because you didn't have a mic, I'll repeat that. The question was, how do you get the tag on the bee? And this is a fun procedure. Um, Sorry about that. I've tried a lot of different methods for this, and what I ended up settling on is dry ice. So I roll up in our lab truck, and I pop the tailgate down and set up my little tailgate lab. And I basically have a modified, um, you guys know what a dust buster is, right? The little hand vacuums. We have modified ones in our lab that basically 
have the, the front cut off and has this capsule on it with a one-way door that we actually use to suck up bees as they come flying into the colony. So that way I don't have to use a net or use just a vial. And I take that bee inside that shop back vial and I put it inside of a cooler of dry ice for about 10 seconds. And the CO2 from the dry ice will knock them out for about 30 seconds. And at that point, I pop them out. I put them on a little tiny stage. I take the little radio transmitter um, with the tweezers or the forceps, put a dab of super glue on it, stick it on the back, make sure it's centered, and then let the bee wake up and recover, carry her over back to the colony, and let her back in. So it's, it, think of it like... Think about like being a dentist, but you don't have access to like the duration of anesthesia or like the Novocaine you're giving the person. So you've just got to be like, go, 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 get it out. <laughs> but when I first started doing this, I had to have my advisor help me to hold the bee down. But I've managed to figure out a way to do it, to do it solo now. And I can actually do four or five bees at a time and then release them all before they start to wake up. So, but it's just, it's just super glue. It's the simplest way to do it. <laughs> yep. Which particular wildflowers would you suggest to attract bees? Which particular wildflowers? Um, pretty much any of them. Any native wildflower is going to be beneficial for bees. Uh, like I said, trying to stick to things that are in like yellow, uh, yellows, whites, and blues are the most beneficial. Those are going to be the ones they like the most. Um, oftentimes, a lot of garden flowers that we have, if you let your basil and oregano and stuff like that actually go to flower. Bees love that. And you'll actually get some really, really cool native bees that you've probably never seen before that will come to those. They're really attractive. Um, we generally suggest that people plant flowers that are available throughout the duration of the growing season. So from basically April until October. So if you can have up to three or so species of flowers blooming pretty much all year long, that's fantastic. Or all summer long, rather. That's fantastic. But anything, so cosmos are a great one. Zinnias they love as well. Um, goldenrod they'll go on as well. Um, purple cone flowers, the list goes on and on. If you want to attract some of the more wild, rare species, things like wild bergamot are really good as well. Right here. Okay, I have a question. Hi. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, go for it. I think the mic's going to go over there in a second. Um, so your big question is finding the place that they like based on their foraging, what they're looking for in the times. And then also you're using, you're placing the bees, correct? That's correct, yep. So have you looked at other factors of maybe the, for the wild bees, what type of habitat that they're choosing to place their hive? And if that, because I was thinking about the cranberries, if they're willing to go farther because it's, you know, maybe foraging isn't as big of an issue for them or the distance that they have to travel. And have you looked at other factors as to where they place their hives and yeah. things like that? Definitely, nest, nest selection with bees is definitely a huge question. And unfortunately, it's a really tough question to ask just because finding these nests, which are, for a good reason, designed to be camouflaged so they can't be found, uh, is a challenge. So bumblebee nests, if you want to find one, it's basically good luck. And um, you can happen upon them. If you see a bee flying into the ground, you can follow it there and see if there's a nest. Excuse me, but um, usually we use kind of surrogate things to look at, things like soil type, um, uh, proximity to major disturbances. If things are being tilled, for example, that's going to have an impact on ground nesting bees. Um, so there are definitely a lot of factors to look at there. But for the most part, um, we tend to try to attack that from the other side because it's a little bit easier than trying to find nests that are already present. Another question here? So from my understanding, bumblebees are very social like honeybees and live in colonies but all other um, native bees are solitary critters? For the most part, yeah. How so, does that affect their foraging patterns? Sure. So I can go through the numbers. I, I left the numbers out because I didn't want to drone on and on like a lecture, but about 90% of wild bees are solitary bees. The other 10% are going to be social. Um, the solitary bees do the same things as the social bees do. They're still going out and gathering pollen and nectar, but they just don't develop a worker population. So that one queen will basically forage for pollen and nectar, and she'll establish a series of nests all over the place and provision those with the pollen for the offspring to develop. So they're still going to be out foraging, but the, the challenge is with them, we can't really track their foraging time because they're not coming back to the same place each time. So but we'd expect similar, similar uh, phenomenon with them. I guess if they're out for longer periods of time from their relative new home, then it would be 
a better, worse environment for them. Question over here. Um, we have uh, bumblebees in our yard, which we love, but they they tend to stay in our structures. Uh huh. Yep. <laughs> Crawling up under eaves and and. Uh, is there some way to encourage them to move without destroying the colony? Um, so bring them a six pack and ask really nicely. <laughs> and they prefer, they prefer honey box, by the way. No, um, no, the best way to do that is just to, you can try to protect the areas um, in some way if you can with like mesh netting or something like that. But for the most part, um, try to provide them with better alternative habitat. So if you have things like wood piles, kind of leaving your yard a little bit messier than you typically would. So having wood piles around, rock walls that have cavities in them. Um, there's, they like to have things kind of messy and more quote unquote natural. So that can kind of help them to, to go there. But they like the structures because they are very well protected. Has there been a decline in bee populations nationwide or in the state due to disease or anything? Uh, yes. Um, so. Definitely a decline in honeybees, uh, basically nationwide. Um, and wild bees as well have been declining, particularly in the Midwest. Uh, there's a lot of data that suggests that a lot of the previously widespread species have actually shrunk by quite a bit. One of the poster child bees for this is Bombus affinis, which is a rusty patch bumblebee that has declined by 90% uh, since the mid-1950s. Um, and a lot of other bumblebees have been kind of on the same path to that. But um, a lot of species are do, still doing pretty well as well, so it's kind of a mixed, a mixed bag. Um, some of our bumblebees go into flowers and they just seem to stay there for a really long time, almost like I don't know if they're alive or dead. <laughs> or Do you know why they're doing that, where they're just staying inside the middle of the flower? Sure, so they, bumblebees will kind of sometimes go out and forage for just pollen, just nectar, or sometimes both. Um, if they're going out for nectar, they tend to just visit really quickly to flowers and slurp up the nectar. But when they're visiting pollen, they can spend minutes on flowers. We did some uh, experiments in a cage setting in our lab where we had these flowers, and some of the bees would sit on there for three, four, or five minutes and move between each of the individual little florets inside and gather everything they needed to gather. I have a question from the library. First of all, they wanted to let you know that there's quite a lively crowd over there. Good. <laughs> Not sure what that means. That root beer, it gets to you. All that sugar. <laughs> they want to know if bees actually eat fruit. If bees actually eat fruit, um, no. They only eat pollen and nectar. That is basically their soul and water. That's their, those are their sole nutrient sources. The nectar is their carbohydrate, and the pollen is their protein source. Um, if you think about things like yellow jackets and wasps, those are more omnivorous. Um, they'll eat dead, decaying meat. That's why if you find yellow jackets all the time around your picnics, they like to go and bother you there. They like to eat fruit, carbonated beverages, all that fun stuff. Um, but bees will not eat fruit. Over here. Okay, getting back to your study, uh, you in indicated uh, time gives you a distance that they go away from the hive. but what if they go north, south, east, west? How can you tell where they're going, what flowers uh, they're going to? That is the, that is the million dollar question. And unfortunately with the time, all I can get, do is guess at a distance. So I can, I can use some sort of an equation that tells me how much food they consume and how much energy that gives them and how much essentially flight time that buys them. And I can translate that based on how fast they fly to a distance. But I can't tell a cardinal direction. I can't tell if they're spending all their time foraging in a really close area or if they're going really far away. Um, what I have to do instead is actually look at the pollen they bring back to kind of tell me a little bit about that story. So I can collect pollen from their legs and say, okay, well, they're collecting goldenrod. And there's no goldenrod anywhere near here except this patch that's a mile away. So that's, I can infer that. But it would be fantastic if I had a GPS tag small enough to glue on a bee. <laughs> The smallest ones that I could find are about the size of a dime, and that's a little bit too big. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure if I talked to someone at like, the Department of Defense, they'd have something that would work for me, but I don't think they're going to be willing to let me borrow that technology, at least not yet. Yes, um, I'm just kind of curious about uh, this behavior that I saw. It's kind of a follow-up to what Tony just described. Um, I came across this group of bumblebees that were inside the Bergamons, but they were 
literally like asleep. Mm -hmm. And I could actually pick them off that were just like in hibernation. So I don't know if that was just a change, a sudden change in temperature or if that's natural behavior. Yep. And I don't know if you take, you must take that into consideration in your study too, the temperature of the day and, yep. you know, for their activity level throughout the day. And then the other thing, I'm just kind of curious about some of the other threats to the native bees, and especially since most of them are ground nesting, does prairie burning have any impact on their colon or on them individually as well? Sure. So the first question was, um, what time of the day was that? It was in the evening. Evening? Okay. So there's a couple of different potential things there. One could be a temperature thing. So bees, like I said, they can, or bumblebees can regulate their body temperature, but if it gets too cold too quickly, a lot of times in the evening, they'll decide, it's, I, I'm too far away from home. I'm going to sleep here for the night. Like yep, and they'll, they'll kind of aggregate on a flower and basically just sleep there. They'll bivy on the flower for the night. And then once the morning comes, they'll wake up. They'll wait for the body temperature to rise, and they'll continue, go back home. Um, there's also the potential that they were confused or got exposed to some sort of nasty chemical. I doubt that's the case, though. Um, and as far as some of the other threats to bees go, there's, there's quite a few. So a lot of the media recently has been on things like pesticides, particularly the neonicotinoids have been in the news a lot, which are a systemic insecticide, which basically means that these, these pesticides or insecticides turn the flower or the plant into a giant, um, it's, it's toxic itself. The actual tissues of the plant harbor this insecticide. And while that's definitely playing some role, it's definitely not the whole part of the story. There's other things to be concerned about as well. Things like uh, new pathogens and parasites. Um, the big one is the Varroa mite. And this is a, a mite, it's called Varroa destructor is the name of it, which can give you an idea of, of its impact. And to liken it to human terms, if you imagine taking a dinner plate and sticking it on your chest and having that thing sucking your blood and transmitting viruses to you, that's what this thing is like to bees. Um, and they can transmit things like deformed wing virus, which has Im impacts for the wing structures of bees. Then we also have things like the amount of flowers in the landscape. Um, monocultures of corn and soy are really, really great if you want a lot of corn and soy, but they don't do a great job, especially when we're Roundup-ready varieties and we're getting rid of all these flowering weeds. There's not a whole lot in these environments for bees to feed on, which is what they need. They need flowers from April to October when they're, when they're active. And that's another big thing for them. Um, and then there's also things like invasive species. So invasive species of plants and invasive species of other bees, other insects, that can be of, of threat to them as well. And then we have climate change on top of that, which basically, you know, that loops around and connects to everything. So it's all interconnected and kind of a messy spaghetti picture of, of factors. Um, one time I watched one of the tricolored bumblebees looking for its nest, and it, it just seemed to take a long time, <laughs> like he, it was having trouble finding it. How, how do they find their nest? Do they do it by scent? So yeah, they, they have a, actually, when you watch a bee fly out of its nest for the first time, this is something that's really easy to do when you have a colony that you put somewhere, they will fly out. And they'll basically, they'll kind of peek their head out and see, okay, not raining, there's nothing that wants to kill me here. And then they'll, they'll, they'll fly out and they'll basically do these little tiny circles around their nest. And they gradually will get larger and larger and larger and then they'll spin off and go away. And what they're doing is they're creating a search image. That's what's thought to. They're creating an image of that environment where their nest is. So they're basically memorizing all the different details about it. They're memorizing what's around the nest, measuring the color. And it's something that I've kind of found really cool is but if I'm there, and I move things around, or I will put my detector there, which is in a black box, and it wasn't there before, when the bees come back, they instantly pick up that something's wrong. And they'll kind of go check out the box. It was in here 20 minutes ago. What is this thing? And even like where my feet were, if I was sitting on the ground, they'll go and use their antenna and kind of touch around and be like, eh, something's not right. And then they'll eventually be like, OK, well, there doesn't seem to be any threatening. And then they'll go inside. Um, so it could be the fact that someone was there or something was there that kind of disturbed the patterns or something that made them a little bit confused. Um, so they do use both sight and they also use olfactory, so senses as well, once they get a little bit closer. Hi. Um, so I am a beekeeper and I bet there are other people in the room who are or have been. I'd be really curious to know that. Um, and I could totally see doing this. I could totally see gluing 
detectors to the backs of my bees because one of the things that I would love to do is know where they're going because, I mean, as you know, it's like impossible once they leave the hive. Yep. You can try to chase them, but there's no way. Yep. And, <laughs> and, and so many things change throughout the season that, you know, it would be really interesting just as a naturalist to kind of know, like, what is blooming right now at each stage of spring through fall? And I would like to know, I don't, think it's, I don't think this exists, but I would love to know if there's any technology that's small enough to actually track the motions of bees while they're out there, not just going through the doorway. And, um, and then, then I guess a, a byproduct question of wondering about other beekeepers is whether you've connected at all with the, the large group of mad bees people in Madison. Yep, so I'll answer your last question first because it's easy. Yes, I actually gave a presentation to them last December be 2013, 14, 13, 14, 2014. That was last year. <laughs> Time is a blur. Um, and that they're a great group, and I'm hoping to kind of stay in touch with them. And as far as the technology goes, there is one thing that has been used, and that's harmonic radar. And that's basically the same thing that they use to radio t collar large animals like bears. And it, it's, it's pretty daunting looking. It's a a transmitter that's many, many times larger than the ones I'm using, and they have this huge little antenna that comes, it, it looks like a, an alien bee. Um, like it has this little coiled antenna sticking out of it. And that can work, apparently. Um, there's a lot of European groups that have gotten that to work. One of the lab members that uh, was in my lab previously tried it, and she could not get her bees to take off with it on, because this is like a huge tag. Like, the, the largest tags that I use are the equivalent of putting a 30-pound backpack on a person. So they're not light, but they're not crazy. And these tags would be like a 150-pound backpack on a person. So I don't know. There's a, there's, a there's a group in Germany, I believe, and in England that got their bees to fly with it. And apparently they have, like, bodybuilding bees <laughs> that are, like, supernaturally strong and can fly this, like, oh, yeah, it's no problem. But... Like, and I've, we still have these tags, that, or we still have these, these radar transmitters that she used. I look at the things, and I'm like, how? Even a queen bee that's huge. Like, I could still have, I would be, I'd be really interested to see it fly. But people have done it. I, I applaud them for that, and I applaud their bees. They should keep doing what they're doing, because it works for them. Uh, uh, I'm not a good public speaker, but... Uh uh, I've, I've been a beekeeper now for four years. I'm retired. I'm 75 years old. Uh, you can only watch so much TV, and a, and a recliner is a, is a death trap. I, I tell my wife all the time, please find me laying out there instead of, <laughs> you know, in the, in the recliner. Uh, some things that, that have kept me really interested in it uh, I never open my hive. I never go to a beehive that I'm not excited. It's it is it is just awesome to lift the the top on a beehive with uh, with uh, 50, 60, 70 thousand females with all having PMS, <laughs> and they're they're intent on one thing, you know, to drive you away from the hive. Uh, I discovered uh, the bumblebee uh, deal last year. I, uh, year before last, I helped my son rebuild a fence, and, and it was cypress. And by the way, I live in South Arkansas. And uh, anyway, we took all the cypress down, and we stored it. And uh, we were going to you know, build the fence later. And during the course of the storage, the carpenter bumblebees moved in and, and built their homes in it. Well, then when I, when I made the fence out of it, you know, I destroyed their home. So I took all the cutoffs and I, and I made a, a bumblebee house and I hung them under the eaves. And I, and I pre-drilled some holes, the, the diameter, you know, that they do naturally. And they went right in the thing. Cool. Yeah, so you can, you can make bumblebee houses. I have eight beehives. Last year I harvested 456 pounds. And... Uh, I do sell some honey. My agreement with my wife is that I sell enough to pay for my hobby. You know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in the honey business, but uh, 
it's a very expensive hobby. This, this lady that's talking about it cost you about $350 a hive with, uh, with, with the bees and the hive parts. And then the extractor that I bought last year was $1,300 just to extract the honey out of the, out of the frames. Uh, I, this year I've harvested 200 pounds already and, and, uh, and I, the reason I didn't harvest more until they cap it, the humidity is not right in the raw honey, so you don't mix it with with uh, with your with your capped honey. Uh, it's 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 like I said, the most interesting hobby that I've ever ever been involved in. The worst pests that I've had, I've had I've lost two two hives to colony collapse. Uh, uh, small hive beetles are my 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 biggest problem, and they're not raising in my hive. Wild bees, they, they, it's like little, uh, uh, like little maggots. Uh, when they lay their eggs in them and they, they, they hatch and they immediately go to eating, and uh, when they reach a certain stage, they leave the hive, fall onto the ground, burrow in, and, and emerge later as a beetle. And that's where my beetles are coming from. They're, they're wild because I, I control my beetles with a bottom board that has wire mesh in it. Under the wire mesh, I keep a, a uh, now these are bought deals. I keep uh, dishwasher detergent in, in the water. And as the, be as the beetles enter the hive, the bees meet them. And they agitate them to a point to where they look for refuge. And when they go under that wire, they fall into the soapy water and drown. That keeps me from having to use any noxious chemicals in, in my hives. I've never, I've never put any chemicals in my hives at all. Uh, on some of sure. Well, the first is the, is the nest. So that's awesome that you're actually building these nests. So there's a whole subset of wild bees that only nest in wood, and they basically will there's things like carpenter bees, which will do this, and also things like mason bees and leafcutter bees. And you can build these things really easily. Just take a 4x4 four four post, a 6x6 six six post, and drill these holes that he's talking about. And that basically just acts as a attractant. People call them bee hotels um, or bee condos or whatever you want to call them. And they work really, really well to attract bees. And you can put them out in your garden, and you can actually see at the end of the year when they're plugged up with either leaf matter or mud, that you actually have a whole row of larvae in there that are ready to emerge that next year, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, bee stings. Everybody's afraid of a bee. The one thing that you have to remember about a bee is that the, uh, the venom detaches from the, the, the bee that stings you. And if, you'll, if, you, if you don't just wipe it, you know, scratch at it immediately, you'll notice that the muscles in the, in the venom sac or pulsing, so it's injecting you with the venom. So you should never scratch one off. You should take a sharp instrument like, and and get under the under the uh, bee stinger and the venom sac and 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 scratch it off of you that way. All right. Thank you. And that's and one thing important about that too. Honey, oh. Only honeybees uh, will actually leave the, vet, the stinger behind when they sting you. Bumblebees, mason bees, all of those things will sting you repeatedly. Their stinger is retractable, and it does not have a barb on it so that it will not stick in you. So if a bumblebee lands on you and starts stinging you, it will keep stinging you until you remove her or dispose of her in other ways. So. Yep. Just an observation more than a question. We have bumblebees in our front yard, but... They're very docile. I mean, they're almost friendly. And we never threatened by them. We could have 50, we could have 100. And they never seem to be bothered the fact that you're rustling through the flowers. What makes them so calm? <laughs> um, I would call it a food coma. Um, <laughs> that's basically what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're, they're happy exactly where they are eating, basically. And that is exactly what they want to be doing. Like, I, I work in fields where I've been walking through literally tens of thousands of honeybees on these tall, they're basically dandelions, and they didn't care. They could care less. They're like, oh, yeah, hey, how's it going? I'm eating some honey. I'm eating some nectar and pollen here. You know, have a good day. And really, like, 
you can actually, you could pick them up off the flower and they'd probably look at you like, excuse me, eating. <laughs> but for the most part, they really don't care. And that's just because they're, they're in the zone. They, they're happy doing what they're doing. And wasps are very similar this way. If you see like a huge black wasp on a flower, they're actually pretty docile. You can get down, you can take pictures of them, you can look at them, you can observe them, and they don't mind at all, and, which is pretty cool. And if you actually have male bumblebees, which can't sting, then you can pick them up and handle them. Um, male bumblebees typically have a bunch of yellow hair on their face. So if you see a bumblebee with a bunch of yellow hair right here between their eyes, likely a male. Still wouldn't recommend picking them up because there's some females that do have yellow hair there as well and they will sting you. <laughs> Tried that, didn't work. Um, but the males do something else when they're agitated. They can't sting you, so instead, insects have six legs, right? They have four legs, mid legs, and hind legs. And what the males will do, actually, is they'll raise the middle leg up, just one leg on one side, and it's equivalent to basically giving you the finger, being like, <laughs> dude, back off. So they raise their middle leg just like, hey, I know what you're doing. I don't want any of it. <laughs> so... their beverage of their choice and we'll be That's right exactly back. Find a seat, find a new drink. We have a couple questions from you stream, so Tim's going to ask those first. My question okay. actually... Okay, um, hold up. Oh, sure. Uh, we have a few questions coming in on Ustream, so we're going to ask those first. Okay, sorry about that. So um, I think... Uh, Tim has, is going to, uh, we should hear the voice from Tim up in the, Thank you, in the Susan. studio. Yes, we have a few questions from uh, viewers online. The first question is, I came in a little late, so I have, may have missed it, but what is the preferred soil tapes for the native bees in Wisconsin? That's, am I on? Oh. The preferred soil type, was that it? Preferred soil tape types. Are you on? Uh, Jeremy's mic is not on. Now it is? Okay, now try it again. Is. There we go. Um, I don't know the actual names of the soil types in general, but um, generally speaking, bees prefer looser soils that are easy to get into. So things that are tilled constantly or constantly plowed and compacted, they have a lot harder time establishing themselves in for ground nesting species. So. Um, Looser soils are always good for them. That's about the extent of my knowledge on soil science. I'm sorry if there are any soil scientists listening. <laughs> I will I'll work on that, though. That is, that's a question I should probably get more often. We, we have a second question from, from an online viewer. Are there natural predators of bees? Yes. Yes, there are. Um, and this is a chance to, for me to share like the coolest story ever for an entomologist. So. <laughs> every, every person has, thank you for whoever answered, asked this question. Every entomologist, anyone who works with animals always has a favorite. All right, we've lost, okay, try good? again. Okay, there we go, I'm back. Um, <laughs> my favorite insect is something called a robber fly. It's a predatory fly. Um, it's the family of Cilidae, for anyone who cares to know that. Um, and what they do basically is they're an ambush predator. They'll sit and wait for things and they'll fly and they'll jump on them or they'll chase them. Okay. Am I good? There we go. Okay. So there is a type of robber fly mm. that will actually mimic a bumblebee. It looks exactly like a bumblebee in almost every way. The coloration is exactly the same thing as the bumblebees that I study, which is Bombus impatiens. Mm. The only thing that you can tell is that their eyes and their legs and their antenna tell them apart. So this summer I was teaching a workshop at the Lakeshore Nature Preserve on campus, and I was looking for bumblebees in this prairie, and I saw what I thought was a bumblebee sitting on a fl uh, leaf, and it was just sitting there. And I was like, why is this bumblebee sitting on a leaf? There are all these flowers everywhere. It should be gathering pollen and nectar. So I had my camera with, and I took a picture, and I zoomed in on it, and I noticed right away that the legs weren't bee legs. The antenna weren't bee antenna. This was a, this robber fly that I've been searching for for literally like three years. <laughs> Ever since I saw a picture of this thing, <laughs> you want me to use oh okay i'm back okay sorry um no that's totally fine um and i i freaked out and all these kids in this class were kind of looking at me like this guy's crazy i'm like running through this field trying to get vile and like catch <laughs> this thing 
So that's a long-winded answer to a very simple question. Yes, bumblebees have predators. Robber flies are one of them. And this summer, actually, when I was in Cranberry country, I saw one of these robber flies again. And it actually chased one of my bumblebees. And like, I saw one of my bumblebees come out of its hive. And then this robber fly came in and just tackled it out of the air and ate it. So luckily, it wasn't one of my tagged bumblebees. It was just one of them. But I was like, just like in awe, and just like, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, I know I'm supposed to be like conserving bees, but there's this whole natural cycle thing that is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, there are a few predators of them. There are also um, different types of birds that will eat bees as well, uh, but typically because they are stinging insects, most things try to avoid them if they can. That's why they're colored the way they are, is to try to tell things like, hey, I'll sting you, please don't eat me. Okay. <laughs> Mic check. Oh, there, there we go. Do you actually recapture any of your bees and look at the pollen itself to identify the plant material that they're going to, basically? I do, yes. So as the bees return, the only bees that I actually tag with these radio tags are bees that return to the colony that I know are foragers. So bumblebees actually partition their workload. They have bees that stay inside the hive the whole time and will act as uh, nurse bees, for lack of a better term, that will just help to basically take care of the brood. And there are other bees that will go out and just guard the nest. They'll, they'll go out when there's a threat to, you know, sting whatever's there. And then there are the foragers, the ones that actually go out and gather the pollen and nectar. And I will actually vacuum up those ones that are coming back to the nest that have pollen on them. And in the process of tagging them, I'll steal a little section of the pollen off their leg and then mount that on a slide and try to identify the pollen. The other thing, too, is I see lots of very, very tiny, tiny bees. We must have, I mean, I, I, in some ways, I can't tell if they're wasps or they're bees, basically. So what is the difference between a wasp and a bee, especially when you, I mean, I don't, if I, if I had my loop and carried it around, or yep. I'm usually using the reverse side of my binoculars. It <laughs> don't always help. <laughs> but anyway, so if you can just describe our little teeny, tiny bees that we have, and I'm assuming those are really good pollinators as well because they get down into some you know really tiny flowers and yeah, stuff as well. Definitely. So the easiest way to distinguish wasps and bees is that bees are always going to be hairy. They have that hair covering their body. And that hair is branched. So if it has a single strand and then it has all these branches coming off of it. Wasps and all that stuff tend to be bald. They don't have hairs. And if they do, if you look very closely under a microscope, those hairs are single branch. So they just have that stem. They don't have all the branches coming off of it. And that's the, that's the easiest way to determine the difference between them. Bees are always going to be furry like that. Um, and as far as what you're probably seeing, what you're probably seeing are sweat bees. Um, sweat bees range in size dramatically. They can be actually quite large and they can be super, super tiny. Um, but if you don't have a, a scope or at least like a little magnifying glass, that's the easiest way you can look and see. If they're furry, it's a bee. And if they're not, then it's likely a, a tiny little parasitic wasp. Are, um, are bees neg negatively affected by genetically modified plants? That is mm -hmm. a great question. Um, typically, the, the biggest thing that people look at with GMO plants is Roundup Ready varieties of corn, for example, or uh, BT corn. And um, I'll use that as the example. BT is a specific compound that only affects lepidopteran pests, that is, caterpillars. Um, it doesn't have any effect on bees because they lack the actual structure in their gut that that bacterial compound targets. So it doesn't have any effect on bees. Um, where, where, where GMO... Again, there we No, yep. Okay, we're good. <laughs> it's very particular. Where GMOs have the biggest effect is probably Roundup Ready. And that's the fact that we have all these crops that are Roundup Ready that we can spray with this compound that gets rid of all these flowering weeds. And that's the biggest way I'd say, I think that, that um, basically, you know, GMO crops are affecting bees, is that they're allowing us to use these chemicals to get rid of the flowering weeds that bees need to sustain themselves, basically. And I obviously understand the importance of, you know, if you're trying to grow a lot of corn, you don't want things competing with that corn. Um, but a lot of areas will have field margins planted around them that have a lot of flowering crops, or a lot of flowering weeds, rather, that are, provide really good resources for bees. And I think it'd be a good thing to see more of those around. 
we, we haven't heard about the dreaded Africanized honeybee. And so I got two questions. I know that they cause uh, major havoc for European honeybees, but what about the other bee species? Uh, do they cause problems for them? And if, if not, or if that's not a long answer, can you give us the status of the Africanized honeybee and the problems it causes? So the, I don't know quite the status, but I do know a little bit of the biology about what happens with them. So um, they're typically a more aggressive species of honeybees. So there's different sub... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. We're good? We're bad? Oh, I'm back. Wait, no, I'm not. I'm using this one. So, um, where was I? Oh, I'm all lost. Subspecies. subspecies, thank you. Okay, so Africanized honeybees are one of these subspecies of, of honeybees. Um, and all these different varieties have ad advantages to them. And relatively speaking, the aggressive nature of the Africanized honeybee is advantageous to them evolutionarily because they can protect themselves more. And what we've, what was, what's been observed is that when these bees are invading new areas and new habitats, is that typically as they progress further northward and get into colder environments, the cold weather actually makes them more docile. So it basically takes them from the Africanized honeybee and they become basically like a European honeybee, which for people like us here in temperate areas where it gets cold during the summer or winter, that's a good thing for us because these things probably won't be as aggressive as they typically are. But for people who are in Alabama, Florida, Arizona, that's not so good news because they're going to stay aggressive down there where it's hot. And that's where these things initially you know, developed in Africa where it is warmer. So. Uh, we have a question from online. Uh, it says, how far, how far north have killer bees traveled? Any chance that they could survive here? Okay. So it's very similar. I don't know the exact uh, status and location. Um, that's where we need some GPS tags so we can start figuring out where those guys are. Um, but as far as status goes, it's the same thing that I just, I just said, is that as they come up here, they're likely to become more docile if they do get this far north. And I, they're not here yet. Um, I don't think they've really progressed much further than areas of Kentucky, um, but I'm not positive on that. I have to do some fact checking. Oh, that doesn't work so well. Yep. Let's, let's just try going back and forth. Right. My mic might start working all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just, I would just, uh, I've heard a lot about uh, the effects of monoculture, agriculture, where there's, because they're using, or they're raising such huge amounts of similar products, uh, corn, soybeans, and so forth, and that that eliminates the variety of, of pollens and so forth that the bees are needing, and that may be one of the limiting factors for, for them. Is that true? Um, yes, that's definitely one of the things that we count as one of the largest factors that are impacting bee declines is that we have a decline in floral diversity uh, pretty much across the most of the industrialized world as far as the United States is concerned. And with a lack of those pollen resources, if you think about it, um, let's use almond for an example. Almond is a very attractive flower to honeybees and to wild bees, but it's only available for approximately two weeks. All these areas are blooming, there's all these resources available, and when almond stops blooming then, there's nothing. That's, it's, it's the Central Valley of California, it's essentially a desert, right? So there's not a lot of stuff available to them. And those bees that are there, those, any, if there are any wild bees there, are going to suffer because of that. They're not gonna have the diversity in their diet that they need to be healthy. And that's, they're just like us. Bees can't do well eating candy bars and Coke all day. They need to have a diverse diet to kind of help their immune... Bees have immune systems just like we do, and they need that diversity of pollen and nectar to help bolster their immune systems. I had read that there are only two species of bumblebees up here this far north. Is that accurate? Uh, approximately, yes. Um, up here, you can get kind of a mix. Um, 
there could be up to four or five potentially, but there are two common ones up here. And the names are eluding me at this moment. Are you gonna donate your I'm mic? Gonna, I'm gonna donate mine. All right. Let's see if that works. Okay. Hello? Okay, we're good. Okay, so is that? Okay. Went up here. So when we're talking about farming and we have acres upon acres and acres of soybean and also closer, okay, and then maybe acres of cornfields, is the farm industry or the farm agricultural people starting to say, well, maybe we should do soybeans here in corn there and something that blooms in June here and something that blooms in August there for the variety of flowers. Are they starting to think like that or are they not there yet? I think, I think definitely. It's, it's on people's radar. Um, but we have, we have kind of backed our, I wouldn't say backed ourselves into a corner, but we have a, very, a system that works very well to produce the commodity crops that we care about. And there are ways that we could change it to make it, to make it better. Um, but it for the most part it works well, but I think people are very concerned and obviously this is testament, everyone here tonight is here to hear about bees. So obviously people know about what's going on and they care about what's going on, which is awesome. And this is exactly what we need, is we need people who are aware of what's going on, who care about it and want to do something about it. And every grower that I've talked to, and this includes dairy farmers, I know a few from my, my best friend from high school is a dairy farmer and his parents own a dairy farm and they're well aware of what's going on with bees. And every other grower that I've talked to, cranberry, apple, whatever it happens to be, is aware and they want to do something to help, which I think is, is awesome. Question over here. I have a question. You were talking about um, toxins persisting in plant tissue, um, and that was with regard to agricultural industry. But I read that um, products that are on the shelf at big box stores, say ortho weed be gone, for example, that if you apply it to a shrub, it will persist in the woody tissue for say five or six years. Are there products that people are putting on their home lawns and gardens that could possibly persist and harm bees? Uh, the short answer is that is yes. A lot of the pesticides that you can purchase at Home Depot, for example, are, you can actually purchase neonicotinoids and apply them to your plants. And it's very important to notice that these pesticides are designed and tested on bees, honeybees, to try to minimize the impact on these species. And on every single pesticide, there's a label. And the label will tell you exactly what plants and what times of the year and exactly the directions of which you can apply this pesticide. And it's important to know that, that label is a legal contract. You have to abide by that. You have to follow that label. If you're found to be in violation of that label, you can actually be prosecuted for that. Um, so people like growers and farmers have to abide by that. If they don't, they'll lose their application certification so they can't actually use it anymore. Um, and this is all good because this is helping to minimize the impacts on beneficial insects, not just bees, but things that we like, like natural enemies, so ladybird beetles and things that eat pests. Um, but it is important to know, you can educate yourself really easily by going onto a number of websites. The Xerxes Society is one of these things that has a lot of information about how to minimize the amount of pesticides or insecticides or herbicides you're putting in your gardens. And it's also just important just to read the labels, to know exactly what types of compounds you're working with. And if you have questions about it, ask the people working there. If they don't know the answer, call us up. We have a bunch of people in our department, in, our, in Russell Labs, both in plant pathology, entomology, who know all about these compounds and all about their chemistries and how they work and can give you advice on how to use them safely. But the simple thing is if you can avoid using them, please do by all means. If you can find a way to take care of your issue by either weeding or by um, planting plants that you don't care about as like trap crops almost. So there's a lot of different ways to get around using pesticides. We live in a temperate weather zone and there's a long winter time. How many bees do you have to have that are able to winter over so that they're gonna be able to survive to the spring? Because my understanding is that they are in some kind of suspended animation. Mm -hmm. And how about the individual ones that you are talking about? What do they do to winter? Sure. Here? So um, all the solitary 
and social bees overwinter as queens. So for the most part, we talk about, we'll talk about bumblebees first. Bumblebees, at the end of the year, they're an annual colony. They're not like honeybees, which are perennial, which will survive the winter and maintain for years. Bumblebees, at the end of the season, actually right about now, they're producing a bunch of new queens. They're called gines. They're virgin queens. And they're producing drones, or males. Those will all go out, and they'll mate. And then those queens will actually go and establish an overwintering site. So they'll find a place they can dig down to the ground. They'll find an abandoned rodent's nest, uh, a cavity in a rock wall, somewhere they're, where they're protected. And then what they basically do is they start to, uh, they start to develop and produce uh, basically propylene glycol, which is antifreeze, it's alcohol. So that alcohol will fill their body cavity up. They don't have a circular system like we do. They have this kind of open cavity and this fluid called hemolymph, which is basically blood mixed with all the goodies they need, all the nutrients, all the enzymes and stuff. And that propylene glycol acts to protect them from freezing, because when bees freeze, their cells burst, and that's how they get killed. Um, so basically, they, I liken this to they, they basically get drunk um, to, to live through the winter. It's not unlike what a lot of people from Wisconsin do <laughs> when winter sets in. Um, they, pour a nice, they pour a nice thick porter and say, I'm staying inside until April. Um, <laughs> But it works really well for them. And once the temperature threshold crosses a certain, a certain value, um, and then they're not actually drunk. That's, it's just a funny analogy. But they, they stay that way. And once the temperature gets high enough, they'll start to actually detoxify those chemicals in their body, and then they become active again. Um, and then the, the, social, or the solitary bees will do the same thing, except for inside those nests that they provision, all those eggs they provision, they're both males and females. So... Um, it's basically the same thing for them, except for they're protected in that nest until the next year. Um, so what happens like during a spring or summer when there's a crisis in the area, like a fire? Um, and ah, yes. what would the bees do to attain enough to be able to transport themselves to another area? Sure. So a lot of the... Th um, I forgot to ask that, answer that question earlier when someone asked about if wildfires affect them. Um, in prairie environments, if bees are nesting in the ground, luckily the fires that we use to manage uh, prairie areas and grassland areas are very quick, hot-burning fires that don't really warm the soil temperature that much, beyond a few inches, actually. They burn so fast that the soil doesn't have a chance to really fluctuate. And if there are bees that are overwintering in April when we actually do these controlled burns, and they're down in the soil, they're actually well insulated from that heat, so they'll be fine. Um, in the off chance that there is a wildfire in the middle of the growing season, say July, um, potentially that could affect them. If they are, have a nest set up in the area, that could, that could affect them negatively. But um, luckily, we don't have too many crazy out-of-season wildfires here in Wisconsin. We need you to settle an argument over here. Oh, boy. <laughs> I plead who, who does more work, the male or the female? Oh. It, that's an easy question. Um, the females in the bee world do all the work. They are, they are active. Yeah. So the queen, the queen obviously is, is responsible for laying all the eggs. And all of the workers are the ones, are females, that are going out and actually gathering pollen and nectar. The males, when they do emerge, they fly around and drink nectar and mate. I will... Ref I will refrain from any further comment. And that's the way we want to keep it. <laughs> however, however, without the males, the males are the ones that are partially responsible for ensuring gene flow, though. So they're, they're drinking all that nectar to go far distances to mate with other colonies to make sure that the actual genetics of the organism doesn't get too bottlenecked or similar. They're not inbreeding a bunch. 